1977 was the year Porsche introduced the 928 and Saab made Swedish cars exciting by bolting on a turbo. Queen Elizabeth celebrated her silver jubilee and the first Apple computer was sold. In the charts, there was something for everyone, from ABBA to the Sex Pistols. In Formula One, James Hunt had taken the world title in the very last race of 1976. The man he had beaten was Nicky Lauda. There were many who considered Lauda the moral victor, for he'd missed two Grand Prix while recovering from a terrible accident and had withdrawn from the last race when he felt that torrential rain had made the conditions too dangerous. There are more important things than the World Championship, he said. I'll be back next year. The first race of the new season in Argentina and James Hunt begins as he means to continue with fastest qualifying time. Nicky Lauda, scarred but fit after last year's accident, was fourth fastest, ready to fight Hunt for the title. Many drivers were with new teams, but Jochen Maas had stayed with McLaren, while Emerson Fittipaldi was still with Kopasuka. But he was having problems manoeuvring his new car. Clay Regazzoni had joined Ensign from Ferrari, where Carlos Reutemann had taken his place. Temperatures in Argentina were so high that McLaren had to cool the car's tyres rather than heating them, as was usually the case. Towels soaked in water kept the Goodyears from getting too sticky. James Hunt and McLaren team manager Teddy Mayer were discussing tactics for a race that would be tough on both cars and drivers. On the grid, there were many changes. Patrick Depaye was now number one at Tyrrell. Jody Schechter had left the team. John Watson had taken Reutemann's place with Brabham. James Hunt hadn't moved, and neither had Nicky Lauda. But Jody Schechter had made a brave switch to Wolf, a new entry this year. His decision turned out to be a good one, for he won this race. It was the first time in modern Formula One history that a new team and car had won on its debut. With Parche second in the much-improved Brabham Alpha, and with Hunt and Lauder as non-finishers, the season was off to an interesting start. After failing to finish in Argentina, Hunt and Lauder were keen to do better in Brazil. They were two unchanged faces in a field that had many new ones. Among them was Italian Renzo Zorzi, who had joined Shadow. Clay Regazzoni had left Ferrari and joined Ensign, funded by Teddy Yip and managed by Mo Nunn. Is, uh, when he's touching, is it coming out? Ronnie Peterson had changed allegiance from March to Tyrrell, and Australia's Larry Perkins was in the revived and renamed Stanley BRM. Patrick Depaye had stayed with Tyrrell in the six-wheeled P-34, which Schechter had been happy to leave behind. John Surtees had a new driver, Austrian Hans Binder, but had retained the team's controversial sponsor, family planning specialist Durex.
Emerson Fittipaldi remained true to the Brazilian Copa Sucar team, but with Penske's temporary withdrawal, John Watson had joined Carlos Pace at Brabham. Bernie Eccleston, the team's owner, was now playing an increasing role in the promotion of Formula One as a television package. His vision was to have enormous influence. Harvey Postlethwaite, who had designed the Hesketh, had joined Wolf, forming a strong combination with Jody Schechter. Jochen Maas was starting his third season with McLaren, supported by long-serving team members like engineer Alistair Caldwell and team manager Teddy Mayer, who'd started with Bruce McLaren in the 60s. As usual, the temperatures were high at the Interlagos track, making qualifying conditions good. James Hunt took pole position, while Carlos Reutemann joined him on the front row. Reutemann had first driven the Ferrari at the Italian Grand Prix the previous September, when he was brought in in a belated effort to help Nicky Lauda's championship chances. Now, he was a full member of the team beside Lauda. The Austrian was not at home here, and his best efforts were only good enough for 13th on the grid. The start was notable for Pace's dash along the pit wall. From the third row of the grid, he led the field through at the end of the first lap. He stayed ahead for seven laps, but then he collided with Hunt and had to pit for a new nose, ending his challenge. This left Hunt in the lead, but Reutemann was right behind him and pushing hard. So hard that the McLaren's front tyres began to go off and he had to pit for new ones, resuming in fifth place and leaving Reutemann with a healthy lead. Hunt fought back up to second again, but he couldn't catch the Ferrari. The Italian team did well, for Lauda drove steadily from his lowly grid position to finish third. He was helped by a large number of retirements, only six cars finished. By Lauda's standards, it was not a good result, but at least both he and Hunt now had points in their championship accounts. While Jochen Maas prepares himself for the task, Emerson Fittipaldi heads out for practice at the Kyalami track near Johannesburg. This is the time when the driver needs to be able to confer with his manager and his engineers. The job was made much simpler by the new technology that Lotus and other teams were beginning to use. All that was needed was to plug in and talk. James Hunt settles himself into his McLaren ready to go out during practice. The cockpit's tight and constricted, but thanks to work carried out by the designers and the governing body of the sport, it's much safer now in terms of its structure and fuel systems designed to withstand a crash. Seat belts and roll bars are there for Hunt's protection, as is the note from his mechanics warning him that new brake pads need to be bedded in before they reach their full efficiency. As the mechanics might say, it's up to you now, fella. He lived up to their faith in him, taking pole position. Nicky Lauda was third fastest, encouraging after his low starting position in Brazil, Carlos Pace was second, while Patrick de Paillet was third. The Tyrrell six-wheeler was competitive, but it was not the quantum leap in technology the team had hoped it would be. The proof was that no other team had copied the idea. Schechter was fifth in the Wolf, eager to do well on his home track. The simple but effective design of the car obviously suited his driving style, and the team had been an effective unit since the start of the season. Hunt led from the start and held first until, on lap seven, Lauda beat him on breaking into Crowthorn Corner and took a lead that he was to keep. 
While other drivers like Nielsen suffered mechanical problems, the Ferrari never missed a beat. Tragedy struck the race on lap 22. Zorzi's shadow stopped opposite the pits and a marshal crossing the track with a fire extinguisher was struck and killed instantly by Price's car. The extinguisher struck Price's head, causing fatal injuries, but the car continued at full speed until it crashed at Crowthorn Corner, hitting Lafitte's Ligier in the process. The race continued, and although there was a natural reaction to a win among the Ferrari team members, there was a sombre atmosphere over the track as Lauda made his way to the podium to join Schechter and Depaye. Schechter's second place put him ahead in the championship with 15 points, but the Ferrari pair of Lauda and Reutemann were close behind on 13. Despite the podium celebrations, this had been a bad day. The loss of a driver and a volunteer track worker was hard for the Grand Prix family to accept, but the show had to go on. The Long Beach street circuit was a big change from the open spaces of Kyle Army. Colin Chapman and his Lotus team were working hard on the radical new car they'd introduced at the beginning of the season. The JPS3, or Lotus 78 as it was better known, was a major step forward. It was called a wing car because its whole body acted as a wing, albeit one designed to grip the ground rather than to fly. The shape of the car's underside was as important as its top surfaces, and although it had not so far finished in the results, Chapman and his drivers, Mario Andretti and Gunnar Nielsen, knew that it had the capability to be a winner. James Hunt wasn't up with the leaders on qualifying speed and discussed his lack of performance with Teddy Mayer. I want to check that car very carefully for flat spot. I knocked it down there, you may have seen. Andretti showed the potential of the Lotus by taking second place on the grid beside Lauda. Vittorio Brambilla was new to the Surtees team this year. The team was in mourning, along with the rest of those in the pits and paddock. Two weeks before the race, Carlos Pace, who had driven for Surtees for two seasons before he joined Brabham, had been killed in a flying accident. Filling the gaps in the field were Alan Jones, who took Tom Price's place with Shadow, and Hans Stuck, who joined Brabham. Jody Schechter was third fastest in qualifying, showing that the combination of a competent chassis and a Ford Cosworth engine was still competitive even if the engine design was 10 years old this year. Ronnie Peterson was coming to terms with the Tyrrell, another Cosworth-powered car. His practice time put him ahead of Depaye for the first time this season. The other Swede on the grid, Gunnar Nielsen, wasn't so successful. His Lotus was 14 places behind Andretti's. At the start, Schechter shot into the lead from the third row, and he, Lauda and Andretti came through the first corner cleanly. In the middle of the pack, however, Hunt tangled with Watson and the field rearranged itself around them. Peterson took to the escape road and finished up last. Colin Chapman knew the Lotus 78 had the potential to win, but Schechter had taken the initiative at the start and was on fine form. The race lasted 80 laps, and for 75 of them, the South African was driving perfectly, holding off strong challenges from Andretti and Lauda and seemingly in full control of the race. But with just five laps to go, he began to feel a problem. A front tyre was losing pressure and the Wolf's handling was going off. With just three laps to the flag, Andretti saw his chance and got past under braking. A lap later, Lauda was passed too. For Schechter, it was a tremendous disappointment but for Andretti, greeted on behalf of TV by another American racing legend, Dan Gurney, victory on American soil was one of the greatest achievements of his life. Mario, the champ, you're Can you tell me how this, Mario said afterwards, was the happiest day of his career. Lauda, who finished just three-tenths of a second behind Andretti, was now equal first with Schechter in the championship standings.
The packed spectator areas at the Harama circuit for the Spanish Grand Prix showed the popularity of Formula One racing. International stars like Jacques Lafitte from France and Jochen Maas of Germany were ensuring coverage of the races across Europe, while the success of Mario Andretti in the US had raised the profile of the World Championship in its biggest potential market. Colin Chapman was right to make sure his driver looked his best as he made his way to the grid. Andretti was a valuable property. The Ferrari mechanics were making last-minute adjustments to Reutemann's car. It was the only Ferrari on the grid after Lauda spun off in the morning warm-up and was unable to race. Reutemann was on the second row behind Lafitte and Andretti, who both left long black tyre marks as the lights signalled the start. As the car set off into the infield section behind the Harama pits, it was clear that the big battle was going to be between Andretti and Lafitte. Jochen Maas, driving an old McLaren M23 while James Hunt had the new M26, was going to have to work hard. Lafitte's challenge to Andretti lasted just over 10 laps before he had to pit for a loose wheel. The Lotus driver was now in command, although Reutemann was close enough in his Ferrari to take advantage of the slightest error. In third place was Jody Schechter. The Wolf was once again showing it could compete at the top level, and Jody was showing his exceptional driving talent. Andretti and the Lotus 78 were the class of the field, however, and he was never really challenged. Even in mid-race, when he had to deal with back markers, enabling Reutemann and Schechter to get within striking distance, Mario had everything under control. As the run to the flag started, he had a 15-second cushion over the Ferrari, while Schechter was nine seconds further back. In fourth place was Mass and the old McLaren, a satisfying result for the team's number two. Two wins in two consecutive races showed Andretti's potential and helped his championship hopes, while Reutemann's second place did nothing to harm his standing within the Ferrari team. Back in 11th place, happy just to have finished, was Ian Schechter, Jody's elder brother, enjoying a rare race outside South Africa. Mass and Nielsen, fourth and fifth, were sharing the usual post-race inquest with the mechanics. As usual at races held on the Harama circuit, King Juan Carlos was the guest of honour and presented the trophies. Schechter led the championship with 23 points, but Andretti was now second with 20, ahead of Lauda, who had 19. This is the view everyone associates with Monaco, a miniature country ruled by a prince, peopled by millionaires, where the sun reflects from sparkling water and glistening yachts. But it's not always so. The second practice day for the Monaco Grand Prix brought torrential rain. Number eight, Hans Stuck, a driver known for his skill in the wet, was probably the only person to welcome the change in the weather. The rest, including Ricardo Patrese, competing in his first Grand Prix in shadow number 16, had to make the best of it. Fortunately, by the time the prince and princess took their places on race day and the cars were making their way to the grid, the rain had stopped. Jody Schechter was on the front row, second fastest. Hans Stuck was fifth. Jarrier, with new team ATS, was 12th, and Alan Jones 11th. Jacques Lafitte was 16th. Tyrrell had Depaillet 8th, and Peterson 4th. 
Brambia put the Surtees in 14th place. James Hunt was 7th, Patrese in the White Shadow 15th and Andretti 10th while Lauda was 6th. On pole, for the first time in his career, was John Watson. While Schechter composed himself, Ferrari designer Foggieri planned ahead with Lauda. Reutemann, third on the grid, prepared himself for the dash to the first corner. It was always vital at Monaco and it could set the pattern for the race. As the field came through Casino Square for the first time, Schechter was ahead, leading Watson, Reutemann, Stuck, Peterson, Lauda, Hunt, Depaye, Andretti, a hard-breaking mass, and the rest of the field. Down on the seafront, Schechter had pulled out a little over Watson and was driving smoothly and accurately to protect his lead. Watson had clung on, leading three 12-cylinder cars in hot pursuit of the Cosworth V8. The Ford engine had 99 wins to its credit. If Jody could hold on, it would score its century. Watson wasn't interested in the Cosworth century. He wanted to score the first win for the Alfa Romeo flat 12, and he was now pressuring Schechter. Inch by inch, however, the South African was gaining an advantage, and he must have been relieved to see a signal saying he was almost 10 seconds ahead. Thirty odd years ago, the cameras got closer in Monaco than at any other race, as these headshots of Gunnar Nielsen, Jackie Ix, Jacques Lafitte, Patrick Depaye, Ronnie Peterson and Maria Andretti remind us. It's perhaps fortunate we were not close enough to hear what Hans Stuck had to say when his car had an oil fire coming out of Casino Square, but he looked calm enough as he walked away. It wasn't necessary to actually hear what James Hunt was saying as he persuaded Marshalls not to cover his car with extinguisher powder. Body language was enough. Out on the track, Schechter was still holding off Watson, while Lauda had moved to fourth behind Reutemann. It wasn't long before Lauda was past his teammate, but passing Watson would be another matter. In the pits, Walter Wolf's smile showed the confidence he had in his driver. On lap 48, the smile would grow wider as Watson's Brabham went out with transmission failure. As the finish grew closer, Jody was still holding off Lauda's challenge. With one lap left, the wolf pit could almost uncross its collective fingers. But it's not over till the fat lady sings, or in racing terms, till the chequered flag comes down. Lauda would never give up, and throughout that final lap, he bore down on the flying Schechter. At the finish, there was just 89 hundredths of a second between them, but it was a win for the Wolf. For the second time this season, the small team in its first year in Formula One 
had beaten the might of Ferrari and all the other top contenders, and its driver led the championship. Wolf also had the honour of scoring the Ford Cosworth engine's 100th Grand Prix victory. It was just two weeks short of the 10th anniversary of Jim Clark's first Cosworth win in the Dutch Grand Prix of 1967. That meant the engine built with a budget of just £100,000 had won an average of 10 Grand Prix every year since. It was one of Ford's best investments. From the shores of the Mediterranean to northern Belgium, and this time it rained for the race itself. It rained so much, in fact, that the start was delayed, but conditions didn't really improve and when the front row pair of Andretti and Watson reached the first chicane, Andretti got it wrong and put both cars out before completing a lap. In the absence of Andretti, Nielsen took over the role of Lotus team leader, forming a front-running group with Schechter and Maas. Lauda was running in the middle of the field, but he was well ahead of Hunt. The McLaren team leader, running the new M26 again, had gambled on starting on dry tyres. His bet might have paid off, but he was too far back to take advantage when, after 15 laps or so, the rain diminished. All the leaders came in to change to dry tyre equipment, and in the 10 laps that followed the first tyre change, Mass, Brambilla and Lauda all held the lead. Nielsen's stop was the longest, and his chances seemed to have evaporated when he returned to the track in 12th place. But he began working his way through the field, although he seemed no threat as loud as pit crew signalled his comfortable lead. Nielsen kept trying, however, and took over second place behind Lauda on lap 40. But the rain hadn't gone away completely, and on lap 49, Nielsen passed Lauda to take the lead. It seemed that the Swede just wanted the win more than his more experienced opponent. As the police and marshals kept the crowd and the gesticulating members of the press from the podium, Nielsen was celebrating his first Grand Prix win. His fellow Swede Ronnie Peterson was third, but in between, still quietly adding to his championship points score with every race, was Nicky Lauda. The quiet charm of rural Sweden is interrupted by a swarm of Grand Prix cars in full flight. With two Swedes on the podium at the previous race, the Swedish Grand Prix was a big event. Unfortunately for the locals, neither driver was in the leading group. Watson led the first lap, but Andretti was soon passed and looked to have the race in the bag. Jones was one of many drivers that visited Anderstorp's unique in one side and out the other pits. The Australian continued, as did James Hunt, who called in later for new tyres. But pit stops cost places, and neither finished in the top ten. Schechter, who tangled with Watson over second place, was one of the relatively few retirements. Another was Nicky Lauda, whose Ferrari wasn't handling properly. The most important pit stop came with just two laps to go. Mario Andretti's engine had been running rich since the start, and despite driving as if on a high-speed economy run, he realised he couldn't make it to the flag and had to call in for fuel. As Colin Chapman and the Lotus team tried to sort out how many places had been lost, the delirious Ligier mechanics greeted Jacques Lafitte, the unexpected winner. The Frenchman had been as far back as 10th on the first lap, but he'd made steady progress to score the first Grand Prix victory for him and the team. With neither Lauda nor Schechter finishing, and unlucky Andretti scoring only one point for sixth place, the championship standings stayed the same. A new face made its first appearance at the British Grand Prix. Canada's Gilles Villeneuve, who had made his name in Formula Atlantic in North America, was given a run in a McLaren M23. He qualified ninth, showing the talent that was to later make him a legend. Also new was Renault's first Grand Prix car since 1906, driven by Jean-Pierre Jabouille. 
Instead of the three litre normally aspirated engines used by all the other cars, the Renault had a turbocharged 1.5 litre unit. The world of racing was watching to see how it would fare. The ever hopeful Italian Arturo Mezzario was in one of the two marches to qualify out of four entries. Jochen Maas was in one of four McLarens, all of which found a place on the grid. Both were condemned to start in midfield, but Maas's teammate James Hunt was on top of the world. He was starting his home Grand Prix from pole position. Villeneuve was empty, anyway. The oh, all that panic. <laughs> the, closest, the closest was stuck, 20.5. He's liable to be. Being a British driver on pole for the British Grand Prix brings its burdens, from the photographers to having to meet the race's sponsors minutes before the start. Hunt withstood it all, although the sponsors did take second place to team manager Teddy Mayer, who had the advantage of being plugged into James's helmet. <laughs> John Watson, beside Hunt on the front row, was eager for a win. He led in Sweden and he should have won the next race in France, but he ran short of fuel and Andretti won, making up for his disappointment in Sweden. Nicky Lauda's rate of collecting championship points had slowed. In the last three races he'd scored eight, while Andretti had taken ten. He was still leading the championship, but only one point ahead of Andretti and Schechter. Walter Wolff's team continued to show professionalism beyond its years. In Sweden, a track with long sweeping bends, they'd even lengthened the car's wheelbase to improve its handling. The only other team to do this was Ferrari, and theirs didn't work. At the start, it was Watson that went into the lead, fighting off the challenge of Lauda, Schechter and Hunt. The end of lap one, and as the cars shimmered along Silverstone's start and finish straight, young Villeneuve was an incredible seventh behind Watson, Lauda, Schechter, Hunt, Andretti and Nielsen. Further back, the Renault trailed the field. McLaren Pitt signals Mass he's eighth ahead of Brambilla. On lap 10, he will be seventh as Villeneuve pitted with a faulty temperature gauge. He was sent straight out again to finish in 11th place. Watson's lead came to an end after 49 laps when he pitted for fuel. That wasn't the answer, however, and he retired 11 laps later. The Renault's run had come to an end after 17 laps when the turbocharger failed. The car had never been close to the front runners in the race, but Renault was in it for the long run, and the company was prepared to stick with the concept of turbocharging for as long as it took to perfect it. In the end, they did perfect it, and the whole of motorsport would follow the company's example until turbocharged cars were deemed to be too powerful and the technology was banned. The car also pioneered another development that in time would conquer the whole of racing, the radial tyre. This was a French enterprise and it marked the first appearance of Michelin Motorsport. Dark-haired Pierre Dupasquier, the first team member on the scene to talk to Chabouille, ran Michelin's racing organisation in 1977. More than quarter of a century later on, he was still running it and every racing car runs on radial tyres. While they prepared to push the Renault aside and load it into the transporter, James Hunt was maintaining the lead he had inherited when Watson retired. It was good enough being on pole at home, but winning was even better. James shared the podium with Nicky Lauda and Gunnar Nielsen, enjoying the adulation of the fans and knowing that nine points would help him catch up in the title race. But Nicky had added six to his pot and was still in the lead, while neither Andretti nor Schechter had scored. James Hunt comes into the pits during practice for the German Grand Prix at Hockenheim. 
with its high-speed straights through the forest and a twisting stadium section, Hockenheim poses unique aerodynamic challenges. Relatively small changes to such items as what came to be known as gurney flaps on the rear wing would, the teams were finding, have a major effect on performance. The McLarens had a different livery in Germany, where tobacco advertising was banned. However, budgets were not yet big enough to stretch to team shirts without tobacco branding. Duct tape had to be used. John Watson, who is to qualify second fastest, heads out to practice. He's followed by Jean-Pierre Jarrier in the ATS, Alex Ribeiro's March, Alan Jones' Shadow, Ian Schechter's March, Clay Regazzoni's Ensign, and Hunt, who was to qualify third. It was turning into a dream season for Wolf. Jody Schechter had already won two races. Here he achieved his first pole position. Beside him, John Watson was still seeking that elusive first victory for the Brabham Alpha. Safety regulations said that if the car turned over, the rollover hoops must protect the driver's head. The organizers decided to check whether the hoops would do their job on the grid itself. Using simple but effective tubular gauges, they passed along the lines of cars, checking to see that the driver's heads were in fact in the safe zone. At the start, Schechter used his pole advantage to get ahead of Watson, while Lauder and Hunt fought over third. Further back, the fur was flying. Clay Regazzoni got the worst of it, just managing to stagger to the end of the pit wall on three wheels while trailing a shower of sparks. Coming through the stadium section for the first time, the order was Schechter, followed by Watson, Lauder and Hunt. In the McLaren pit, they were counting down to Jochen Maas, who was 10th. Things weren't going well for Maas in his home Grand Prix. He'd qualified 13th, and after 26 laps, he was forced to pull out with a gearbox problem. On the track, Lauder had taken over second when Watson dropped out. After 13 laps, he passed Schechter for the lead. The South African tried his best, but the Ferrari's 12-cylinder had the advantage on the high-speed circuit, and he had to be satisfied with second place. As Lauda was greeted by his team and supporters, he had reason to be pleased. He was leading the World Championship, but it was thanks to regular finishes in the points. He hadn't had a win since South Africa, seven races and almost five months ago. But now, he was back on the top step of the podium, the place he knew he belonged. Schechter's second place kept him in contention for the title, but neither Andretti nor Hunt had finished. Their challenge could be fading. Lauda's win in Germany must have put him in the mood for victory in Austria. Every driver wants to do well on his home ground. Taking pole position was a good start. The morning of the race had been wet and the cars came from the pits to the grid on wet tyres. But then the rain stopped and the skies began to look brighter. Almost everyone decided to change to slicks. Hunt, beside Lauder on the grid, had also opted for wets as he left the pits. Looking at the sky, he gambled, rightly, on improving conditions and swapped them for dry weather equipment. Mario Andretti was third fastest and Hans Stuck fourth, 
but all the times were very close. Less than a second covered the first seven starters. At the start, Lauda beat Hunt and Reutemann shot through from the third row. It looked as though the Argentinian had got ahead of Andretti, but Mario fought back, and as the field came through the new Heller chicane, he was third with Reutemann fourth. Andretti was on a charge, and at the end of the first lap, he'd passed both Hunt and Lauda to lead the field past the pits. Reutemann's firecracker start had fizzled out, and he was down to eighth. Schechter was fourth, and Patrick Tambay in the ensign was a surprising fifth. Andretti continued to lead until lap 12 when his engine failed. This left Hunt in the lead from Schechter. On lap 16, however, Alan Jones, who had made spectacular progress in the shadow, dislodged the South African from second. Jochen Maas pitted, but was able to continue. Hunt wasn't so fortunate. With just 10 laps to go, his engine failed. Jody Schechter went out too, after a collision, while his brother Ian made a spectacular exit at the chicane. While other drivers retired, Jones drove on in the smooth and workmanlike manner that was to become so well known. He took the flag some 20 seconds ahead of Lauda, earning first Grand Prix victories for Shadow and himself. The Shadow had promised greatly this season, but the turning point had been the return of designer Tony Southgate after a spell at Lotus. His input had transformed the car, and Jones was able to get the best out of it. As an undemonstrative Jones was shepherded to the podium by officials, Nicky Lauda must have been thanking his lucky stars. Yet again, a win had eluded him. However, in finishing in the position racing people call the first of the losers, he gained six championship points. And once again, his rivals, this time all three major contenders, had failed to finish. Carlos Reutemann leads the cars lining up to head for the grid in Holland. The Argentinian was sixth fastest and would start behind Nicky Lauda, who was fourth, just four hundredths of a second slower than James Hunt. Ahead of them were Jacques Lafitte, back on form again, and Mario Andretti, back on pole again. The start saw Lafitte lose out and Hunt come through, challenging Andretti and getting the vital inside line into the Tarzan corner. Andretti lost ground to Lafitte too, and on the first lap he was third. Mario was on form, however, and at the end of lap two he passed the Ligier in front of the pits. The battle between Hunt and Andretti was one with no holds barred, and on lap six the two dived into the Tarzan corner side by side. The result was not unexpected from two such forceful drivers, and it led to Hunt's retirement. Back in the pits, he put his point to Lotus boss Colin Chapman. First lap was in the fourth. Couldn't you he see right holding him up? Listen, Colin, it's his job to get past. I'm entitled. If I'm leading a race, I don't have to give way, right? Okay, Colin, that is true. You Would you ask your happen. driver to give, give way? It's his job to find a way around. He's very quick. All he has to do is bide his pace. And see. Ten laps later, Andretti was forced to retire. Lafitte was now in the lead, but Lauda was pressuring him. As the pair passed the pits on lap 22, the pressure paid off. Lauda was now leading, but teammate Reutemann wasn't so lucky. He had been third, but just before the race's halfway point, he had to pit for attention to a damaged rear wing. Both Tyrrells retired. Peterson's had fuel feed problems, and Depaye pulled off at Tarzan when his engine expired. Ferrari designer Mauro Foggieri was looking anxious, and with cause. Lafitte had stuck to Lauda like glue, 
and now was the time for one last desperate effort. He didn't come off, however, and Lauda took the flag with the Frenchman just 1.89 seconds behind him. This was only Lauda's third win of the season, but he'd scored points everywhere except in Sweden. Schechter was third behind Lafitte, and Patrick Tambe brought the underfunded Ensign home fifth, despite running out of fuel. Monza, and McLaren team manager Teddy Mayer tells a disbelieving James Hunt he's just set fastest practice time and taken pole position. And then Michelle changed her mind, she said 38.5. Herman's done a 38.66, on the last lap. Some stage. No, I don't think so. Oh, 39. I thought I pulled Herman for 38.2. Walter Wolf could be satisfied with Schechter's third place, while a jubilant Hunt discussed his time with Goodyear's Bert Baldwin. Despite the fact we didn't have any new tyres, we did it. <laughs> well, we had one new set, but it was completely tough. Do you know what I did on this new set you gave us? I was using this morning's old scrub one. I couldn't get under 40 with What's the that? new set. There was something wrong with it. There were the ones to run. Well? Looks like they were the ones to run. Everybody would like that set you had. That set that you got Paul on, anybody would swap you a new set for this, right? No, no Bersicus. Right, Jamicus? No, Bersicus. No, Shittikus. All Shame the truth is fantastic. Maybe it was being in Italy that caused the outbreak of Pig Latin. Mario Andretti was fourth on the grid, and Nicky Lauda was fifth. Rumours had started to spread that he was going to Brabham next season, so he wasn't as popular with the Ferrari-loving Monza crowd as he might have been. Not that the single-minded Austrian was likely to be too worried about what the crowded grandstands thought. As the drivers were shaded from the afternoon sun and the last-minute details were attended to, the drivers began to concentrate on the job ahead. When the grid finally formed up after the parade lap, the starter held the cars too long. Steam started to rise from Lafitte's car on row four and Reutemann almost decided to start on his own. Finally, everyone got away apart from the overheated Ligia. Amazingly, Lafitte got the car going and finished eighth. Schechter led the early laps, with Andretti soon deposing Hunt from second place. Hunt never really lived up to the promise of pole. He spun while lying third and finally retired with brake problems. But the man on form was Andretti. He passed Schechter after ten laps and never lost the lead. As Colin Chapman celebrated in his usual manner, the Italian crowd could content themselves with the fact that Mario was at least born in Italy. Lauda finished second and Alan Jones again showed that he and the redesigned shadow were a force to be reckoned with by taking third spot. In the championship, Lauda's sixth second place of the season meant he now had 69 points to second man Schechter's 42. In the Constructors' Championship, the efforts of Lauda and Reutemann had ensured that Ferrari was already unbeatable. For Lauda, one more race should do it. Having visited the west coast of the USA in sunny April, the Grand Prix Circus returned to the east coast and Watkins Glen in a cold, damp October. Hans Stuck had set second fastest time in practice, which was dry, and he must have thought it was his birthday when race day was wet, providing his favourite track conditions. Despite the fact that some rain tyres were overheating, Stuck dominated the first 14 laps until his car jumped out of gear and he went off the track. Hunt inherited the lead ahead of Andretti and Schechter, while in the Ferrari pits, all eyes were on Lauda. He was lying fourth and on course for the title. And that's the way it finished. Hunt's second win of the season was all the more satisfying because he'd beaten Andretti. Mario was not his best friend since the collision at Zandvoort. Schechter and Andretti were underlining their second and third places in the championship and Lauda was doing what he did best, scoring just enough points to take the title. Relationships between Lauda and Ferrari had grown difficult over the season 
and with the championship crown on his head and a Brabham contract in his pocket, he decided not to participate in the last two races of the season in Canada and Japan. Schechter won in Canada and Hunt in Japan, but neither could approach Lauda's points total. To replace Lauda in Canada and Japan, Ferrari had a new young driver. His name was Gilles Villeneuve. Looking at the championship results overall, the newcomer that stands out is Alan Jones. But the story of the season was Lauda's consistency. Of the 15 races he contested, he only failed to score points in three. Both Schechter and Andretti had the same number of wins as Lauda, three, but they didn't have the Ferrari's reliability. Put that reliability with Nicky Lauda's skill, professionalism and sheer guts and you have the story of the 1977 championship.